How's everyone doing? Good? Well, I'd like to welcome all of you. My name is Marisol Rivero. I'm the activities director at this great establishment, Miami Senior High. I'd like to thank you for coming uh, for this very important and great project. Um, before I introduce someone that's very important to this project, I would like to ask who needs translation of what's going to be discussed here in Spanish. If you need us to translate it to Spanish, please raise your hand. Okay. Ah. So we won't need translation. Hay alguien que le haga falta que le hagamos un tras traducir la es al español lo que vamos a decir aquí en inglés hoy. Everybody understands English? Thank you. So we are here as part of uh, this program, the Underwater Project, created by Xavier Cortada and his team. At this time, I would like to welcome or introduce to you his executive director of the Ex Xavier Cortada Foundation, Mr. Adam Roberti. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. I feel like this. All right, so we really appreciate all of you guys coming out here today. Um, we've been doing a lot of work here at Miami Senior High School over the past month. Um, we, I mean, Xavier Cortana, the artist, who unfortunately couldn't make it here today uh, because a few days ago he tested positive for COVID-19. So uh, he, is doing, he is doing well, he's doing better than he was a couple of days ago, so no need to worry about him, but we're, you know, clearly he wouldn't be able to make it here tonight. Um, wishing him a, a speedy recovery. Um, but under his guidance, myself as the executive director of the Xavier Cortada Foundation, and particularly our two uh, co-coordinators, Leah Hensler and Matt, uh, <laughs> Matt Ellis Ramirez, have gone into every single science class at this school and given interactive art presentations around the climate crisis, and we have engaged over 2,000 of the students at the school, the majority of the school, with the understanding of our vulnerability to sea level rise, to saltwater intrusion, and you know, so these are some of the topics that we're gonna be discussing here today. But importantly, we didn't just give a presentation with a bunch of facts and data. We actually engaged students in an art project. And the art project, you'll see uh, over the course of this, of this town hall meeting, you're gonna see a bunch of pictures just kind of scroll through of the work that was done. And what you're gonna see are these big blue yard signs with a lot of numbers on them. And to put, to put it simply, we had every student who participated find out their home's elevation above sea level. They went on the app, Eyes on the Rise. We have it out there for you guys after, the, after this um, in our town hall, in our uh, community connection fair event for you guys to find out your elevation if you don't know it. But once all of these students found out their home's elevation above sea level, they took that number and they put it, depicted it, painted it, drew it on top of this yard sign. And it's a yard sign that we asked them to go home and plant in their front yard. And the idea is that if, you know, a couple of thousand Miami Senior High students who live generally around Little Havana, broader Miami area, start putting up these yard signs, with these numbers that, that they are aware of, but that their neighbors are unfamiliar with, it's gonna start conversation. And that's what we've been seeing happen at the school and in talking to the students, what's been happening outside of school is you have a, a sign in your yard that doesn't say for sale, it does not say uh, vote for somebody, it's a sign with an eight or a four. And it's weird and it's strange and it gets your attention and that's, that's the point. And when your uncle or your friend comes over, they ask you what that means. And that's really the idea here is that we're trying to facilitate conversations, not just about climate change, but what we as a community can do to begin to prepare for it and what we can do to try to solve some of the really complicated problems um, that we're dealing with. So this project is presented in partnership, obviously with Miami High, which is Xavier's alma mater. He's a, 
a graduate of the year 1982. So 40 years ago this year, he graduated from, from this auditorium. I assume he walked across the stage. Um, but also in partnership with the University of Miami. And what we have for you tonight is a panel of experts who are here to discuss uh, their, their expertise. And this is an interdisciplinary research team that Xavier and I are, are a part of at the university. It's part of UM's U-Link program. And it's, that's the university's laboratory for integrative knowledge. And our team focuses on climate migration mostly, but adaptation and understanding what our community is going to do with rising seas, with, the diff with heat, with the different impacts of, of a changing climate. So with that being said, um, before we get into it and, we, and I bring up um, our faculty and our team and we, do, we just do a quick round of introductions, I want to read you uh, a letter that Xavier wrote because he wasn't able to be here today. So I'm gonna read you his words um, and this is what he would have been saying if he was standing here. I was not supposed to be the one standing here, although I was integral in making the project happen. Um, he is obviously saddened at his in, uh, inability to be here. So this is the message from the artist, Xavier Cortado. 40 years ago, I graduated from this high school. I'm a proud member of the Miami High class of 1982 and the Miami High family. Ours is the first school established in Miami-Dade County. It has a rich, beautiful history that has grown alongside our city. So many people, many of them immigrants, or like me, sons of refugees, walked these halls as they journeyed to a better future. Today's students continue on that path of learning as they grow to become our future leaders, the future of Miami. But these students also have a tremendous challenge. We spend our lives working to deliver them a better tomorrow, a promising education, family, a career. However, I worry what Miami's future is going to look like 40 years from now when students here reach my age. And what future will the class of 2062 inherit from the class of 2022? Like our school, most of our homes and community were built in flat Miami at a time when no one expected that Miami's geography and geology would make its residents so vulnerable to the rising seas. By the time I was in high school, our society knew that polluting carbon into the atmosphere would warm our planet, cause polar glaciers to melt, and raise our seas. Unfortunately, in these past 40 years, little has been done to truly tackle the amount of carbon we, as a society, pump in the atmosphere. And that has to stop. I developed the Underwater, this participatory art project, to help us better understand our vulnerability to global climate change and sea level rise, and to give us the tools so that we could take action. We've shared our knowledge with all the science students of this school, and they're sharing them with you, and in hopes that they will inspire you to learn more about the problems facing us. The challenges before us are great, but so are our students. That's Xavier's letter. So with that, what I would like to do is move us into this, uh, this town hall portion. Um, I'm going to welcome up our University of Miami team. Um, we're gonna do a brief round of introductions and then we're gonna come over here to the panel, uh, to the table and talk a little bit. And then we have, if you guys looked in the back, we have two uh, young women with black shirts and a white mangrove logo on top. They are here as part of the Xavier Cortada Foundation to give you guys a voice. So the idea with this town hall is not just that we are lecturing you for an hour, it's that we're having a conversation, we're having a dialogue, so we want you all to be able to ask questions. We want we want to hear your concerns. So they're there to provide a microphone uh, to you all as we as we move into that. So, but that being said, can I please welcome our University of Miami team to the stage? All all five of you that are sitting there. Um, give them a round of So I think what we're gonna do is I'm gonna have us just give a brief 30 second to a minute as to who you are. And, uh, and yeah, but we're, gonna, we're gonna stand right here. Um, Catherine, if I can ask you to go first and then I'll round it out at the end. I'm Catherine Locke. I'm a faculty member at the University of Miami and I work with these Dynamo colleagues thinking about the changing climate 
how it's affecting us here in Miami, in Southeast Florida, more broadly, and what the solutions are. And really look forward to talking with you more about your thoughts on these topics. Hi, I'm Jessica Alley. I'm a professor of law at the University of Miami, where I direct our environmental law program. So I work a lot on different ways that we can use legal mechanisms to try and fight a lot of the problems that you'll be hearing about. Hey everyone, I'm Nikosi Muse. I'm a second year PhD student in environmental science and policy, working under Catherine. I'm also a member of the City of Miami's Climate Resilience Committee. Um, so I'm also open to hearing everything you guys have to say about the climate crisis as well. Hey everyone, I'm Jennifer Neiman. I'm a research analyst at the University of Miami and I research climate science through uh, uh, quantitative methods, specifically through the lens of society. Um, so a lot of ways that climate change is affecting us as humans, you as people, um, that's what I'm researching and I'm really excited that you guys are here today. Hello everyone, my name is Alex Nyberg. I am a third year PhD student. Um, I am studying environmental economics and climate change. And I will uh, be Xavier in this moment and say that Xavier Portada is the socially engaged artist of this team working to engage community, peak curiosity, and hopefully empower us to find the solutions to uh, encourage the policy change. Um, and so I am here as the executive director of the Xavier Cortada Foundation to give his perspective. Um, so with that, let's have, uh, I think the four of us, we're gonna stay on the stage. Um, Alex and Jennifer, you're gonna come back down, I think. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and we're gonna go over here and we're gonna turn those mics on. All right, thank you very much. is to do climate science 101. What is climate change? What is global warming? Where does it come from? Why does it matter? And most importantly, what can we do about it? So as Adam introduced, so many activities in our daily lives put heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. We don't even realize it. So when we use the lights in this building, or when we drive to the grocery store, or when we eat food at home that's traveled from the farm to our plate. All of these activities in our energy system, our environment, and our agricultural systems depend on, in our current world, emissions from fossil fuels. Oil, gas, coal. And all of this emission of heat trapping gas through time has led to quite a bit of warming of our atmosphere, our land, and the oceans. And we'll talk a little bit about why this heat matters, but the heat also changes the environment around us in a bunch of different ways. So for example, an ocean that is warmer gets bigger. Glaciers that are warmer melt into the ocean. The ice sheets on our poles of Earth are also contributing to sea level rise. So we're gonna to start to put these pieces together. In terms of why we are experiencing these damages on every single continent from the changing climate and things that we experience here locally as well, I think of them coming in two different flavors. So number one, there are extremes from the climate system, the sharp end of the climate system. So the fact that our hottest days are now getting hotter or our most extreme storms you want to prepare for hurricane season, be sure to see the county booth afterwards. They're now coming on shore on top of sea level rise. And so these supercharged extremes are part of what we need to deal with in the changing climate. But there's also the cumulative burden. The fact that in our lovely warm climate here in South Florida, every single day on average is getting a little bit hotter. Or every single tide coming on shore is a little bit higher and something that sometimes we see in terms of driving through water on the road. But the real thing here is that if we don't take ambitious action, all of these types of impacts are getting worse. And as Adam described in the words of Xavier, this is really a generational challenge. And for those of you who are students today, 
it matters incredibly over the course of your life and the lives of your kids as well into the future. I would say the, the really good news is that most of the responses for addressing the root cause of climate change are technologies that exist now. We can get to 80% reduction in emissions of heat trapping gases based on technologies that we have now and that are cost competitive. So solar panels here in our sunny climate, windmills, uh, shifting towards reducing deforestation around the globe. There's still really important open questions about how we deal with, for example, long distance shipping, air travel, cement, steel. But I would say the, the really powerful thing for the younger generation is the fact that we mostly know how to do the solutions. It's a question of making them happen. Uh, rallying here in South Florida, requesting action from our governments, encouraging the private sector to push forward with solutions, and certainly you all are much more effective than the old people on stage in rallying for action. And Adam and Coase, I won't, won't put them in the old people category. <laughs> but honestly, there is so much that can be done. And as you'll be hearing from Coase especially, there are also many different efforts underway to address the impacts that can't be avoided through reducing our emissions of heat trapping gases. As you'll hear from Coase, there's a ton of incredibly novel, first in the nation work happening on extreme heat and chronic heat that's getting worse here in the county. You also should go talk to Christian at the end and learn about what the county is doing related to sea level rise and adaptation action areas and really trialing a lot of these different solutions. So we'll be shifting towards solutions from Jesse and Coase, but I think the most important thing is there's tons that we can be doing to address the climate challenge and we look forward to hearing your thoughts about all of these issues. Awesome, thank you. All right, I have to start my timer because lawyers talk forever. Um, okay, thank you guys so much for, for being here today, for staying after school, coming to listen to this. I'm really encouraged to see the students here. All right, so Catherine just told us about all these terrible problems, and, and I'm at this end of like, okay, what do we do? What are, what are, how do we address them? What are our next steps? And there's so many different steps we could take, right? There's a lot of work out there for scientists, for engineers, and I hope a lot of you do that. There's a lot of work for the community groups that you see are out there in the hallway for our churches, our neighborhoods, our environmental organizations. I'm gonna focus on how we can think about law and policy as being one of our solutions in this bigger toolkit that we need to use. Uh, and when we think about our laws and our policies and our ways to tackle climate change, there's two kind of big categories I tend to think of. One is kind of how do we mitigate, how do we stop the worst of the problems from happening? How do we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions? And that's a pretty tricky problem politically, but as Catherine would suggest to you, I think convincingly, not so tricky technologically. So the questions of like, how do we, what's the technology to help us mitigate or cut back on some of our emissions? We already have the scientific tools, but we are pretty bad on trying to figure out how to implement, how to put the policies into place. The other side of that is once we know that the climate change is already happening, which we feel very much here in South Florida, we see it, we feel it, we experience it, we know it's getting worse. We also have to think about how laws and policies can help us respond to or adapt to those changes that we know are coming. These are two very tricky problems and from a policy standpoint, kind of addressed in slightly different ways. The way I tend to think about kind of tackling legal problems is I think about our different levels of government and who's the right actor. And I'm gonna start at the really high level so that we can move to other people who talk at the more local level. We hear people all the time say, climate change is a global problem and we need a global solution. I mean, we call it global climate change, right? So you think the best way to address this is to work at the international level. We should have our presidents, our prime ministers, our leaders of different countries come together. And this makes a lot of sense because Activities that happen in China and Brazil and in Texas, they're gonna affect us here in Miami. We could be awesome. We could be the best at cutting back our emissions. We could be the, like, the best environmentalists ever. And it's not gonna really change anything. Our, our seas will still rise. Our houses will still be inundated. We're still gonna struggle with the heat waves and the storms if other people aren't always, are also acting. And therefore, it's very attractive to think, let's look to our world leaders to come together and make some decisions about how we could fight those problems together. 
The problem is that you have 200 countries, roughly, coming together to try and agree on how you go about doing that. And it's a super slow process. We're inching along bit by bit with agreements that don't really make much progress and then the leaders change and we start over again. And so our long-term kind of looking to the political leaders at these international scales has not been very successful. In particular because the changes that we know are needed and that we know how to do often require making changes to our lives that aren't so comfortable making changes that might hurt our economy, and that's very risky for a politician in particular to embrace when they know they have another election facing them, when they're worried about what's at home. And not all of them are experiencing climate change problems equally, so some of them are much more motivated in this sphere than others. We have our countries also operating in two main ways in that mitigation adaptation buckets that I was talking about. So from a mitigation standpoint, they're all coming forward and saying how much they're planning to cut back on their economy. And they are largely not delivering on those obligations. From an adapt adaptation bucket, they're coming forward and saying, here's all the money we're gonna give the low-lying countries, the people who are struggling. And we are also seeing them not really delivering on that side either. So my, my unhopeful message here is that we need to kind of look beyond the international stage where so much of our time and energy is gone and thinking about climate change. So if we move a little closer to home and look perhaps at Washington, D.C., let's look at our own government. Let's look at our president, our Congress, our Senate, and see what types of things they can do. Well, again, my, my, my picture is not so rosy for us. We do not have a climate change law. We do not, we have a lot of federal environmental laws, a law to prevent water pollution, a law to prevent air pollution, laws to de deal with toxic waste. But we have never stopped as a country and actually created a coherent strategy to deal with climate change. And it's interesting, it's become a very partisan, a very divided issue of whether or not you support climate change, which historically is unusual for environmental law. In the 1970s, when most of our environmental laws were passed, they were passed with both sides, the Democrats and the Republicans agreeing that we wanted our kids to be able to breathe clean air and drink clean water and, and have a freedom of, from living in toxic sites. Uh, they were signed by a Republican president who would announce with great fanfare how wonderful this was to take these important measures. But now it's become so tied to the economy, it's just a little, it's become hard to think of the, our legislature passing a climate law. So instead, what we do as lawyers, we work in little bits and pieces, trying to find different little spots where we can insert some environmental protection. How can we bring the idea of climate change into a law that was about you know, smog? How can we bring climate change into a law that was protecting species? And it's moving forward slowly, slowly. Moving forward slowly, slowly in a problem that's not moving forward slowly, slowly. So again, we need to move down a layer and then we can try and look at our state. Now state, uh, different pictures depending on what states you are. States, are. states in the United States here have been very effective in, in made, moving forward and making a difference in climate change, but not all states are created equal. California is much more progressive than Texas on this. Florida is a mixed bag. It's a really interesting state to work in. On some level, we really want to promote, uh, we're the sunshine state, right? We want to promote solar energy, we want to develop. But on the other hand, we the biggest lobbyists, the biggest supporters within our, within our state are the utilities and the agriculture industry, and they kind of fight back. So we have a back and forth going on with our state as well. We do just have uh, an announcement of a hundred of a goal now at the state level of 100% renewable energy by 2050 coming out of the Department of Agriculture. We'll see where that announced goal heads, but we do have some movement happening at the state level, which I think should be encouraging. Um, but I'm super happy to actually be able to pass this on to somebody who can talk about some of the things that are going on uh, concretely here in our local governments. City governments, county governments are where the most action is happening and the most creative action is happening. And also one of the only places where we really see governments, politicians tackling that adaptation side. It becomes such a local question that almost it's hard to think of it in a big scale of how do we adapt to the change that are coming. I always try at these talks to try and like end with these really encouraging and helpful and upbeat notes of you can make a difference and I have 
really begun to struggle with that whenever I'm talking about these higher levels of things because I think actually what we should think about is, uh, is being angry. I think we should think about being angry and about being upset and being disappointed. And I hope that while well, many of you are scientists and activists, I also hope that some of you become lawyers and, and politicians and think about how you could do this differently because we are not doing a good job right now. So as Jesse made very clear, there are clear delineations between global, you know, national, um, state, and then even more local, like city and county, ways that we make changes when it comes to climate change. There are very particular ways that we can go about it here in our local jurisdictions as well. So before we're thinking about a global scale, a lot of what informs global scale a lot of times is research. A lot of the research that we do that informs us to know that, hey, the sea level is rising globally, the temperature is going up globally. And that research also informs local agendas too. We know that sea level rise is a thing here. We know that the temperature is going up and is a thing here because of the research that we've done. But let's really zoom into Miami Dade. And here's a fact that may light a fire under your butts. 26, well first think of the United States as a whole tens of thousands of square miles. And then think of small Miami-Dade, a small fraction of the country in the southeastern portion of Florida. Now, everywhere across the entire country that's threatened by sea level rise, Miami-Dade encompasses 26% of that. And the state of Florida is probably around 40% of that. So, meaning, we have a lot of work to do here. And the thing is, a lot of the work that we can do here is, is motivated by us. A lot of the people that we work under, such as you know, even my advisors and, and our teachers and our classes, you know, and, and the people that run our companies, they're not the ones that are going to make a change when it comes to climate change. It's going to be us, it's going to be the folks that look younger than me. And we've seen that, and it's been so evident in many of the different budget hearings that we've had in the city of Miami or Miami-Dade County, like we, at one point, we didn't even have a chief resilience officer in the city of Miami, or a resilience office or sustainability office in the county in general. That changed because people came out and spoke. Now, local knowledge may not be as important on the global scale, but it's definitely important for Miami, uh, the city of Miami and Miami-Dade as well, because we're making changes based on how you feel especially when it comes to something like extreme heat. For example, I'm conducting a study right now with some of my colleagues on how indoor heat feels, because if you can't cool down indoors, where are you gonna cool down that? Because outside is going to be very hot too, but that doesn't mean that we don't focus on putting trees up and planting trees and, and making sure that roads aren't super, super hot as we walk over them and they have some type of permeable or reflective pavement. There are ways to go about changing policy here in Miami. I know sometimes we seem, it seems like, you know, us as individuals, we're super helpless in trying to make a change, but I promise you, we're not. If we come out in droves like we've done for these budget hearings and securing you know, positions like the chief heat officer that Jane Gilbert now holds, position that she holds, or the three resilience the deputy manager programs that we have for the city of Miami, they're all looking to see you come speak and talk about your experiences. And even with us researchers too, please get involved. There's Catalyst, there's Clio, um, the Cortada Foundation, as you know, they've been doing great work in the communities and they're looking for citizens and residents of Miami to come and talk about what it is that they're experiencing because ultimately your knowledge is the most important knowledge. And yeah, I'll wrap up with that. We also have a city of Miami Climate Resilience Committee that directly advises the city commission. So if you give your concerns to us, we can give those concerns to the commission and it's a chain. And once we have that chain established, I think we can really get a lot of stuff done here in the city of Miami, or Miami Dade County. Thank you, guys. Yeah, good <laughs> so, we've heard now about the problems that we're dealing with, about the, with the climate, the problems that we're dealing with when it comes to changing the laws to address the climate. Uh, on, a, on a federal level, on a state level, at a community level, like right here in Miami-Dade County. And you might be sitting there thinking that it's odd that there's an artist on this you know, science law team, um, and I want you guys to understand the role that art has to play in solving these problems, and that's what Xavier would be here talking to you guys about. And that would be understanding that we need extremely creative solutions 
to solve these problems. These are extremely complicated problems. And right now, not enough people care to talk about them or try to address them. And what we need to do is we need to, we need each other. We need we need collective action. We need, as as Kosi was just saying, we need we need each other to join organizations that are on the ground right now doing 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 great work. We need to go urge our elected officials. But how do we really start to facilitate those conversations? And so what Xavier has been doing for decades now is he has been creating processes. And so not simply a painting that goes on a wall and we look at it, a process that engages you, it piques your curiosity. Many of you are probably familiar with um, his Miami mangrove forest, which underneath the highways, you've probably seen the little mangrove propagules, little seedlings that have been painted on the columns underneath I-95 in downtown in Alapata. These are, these are, this is one iteration of how an artist can pique your curiosity, but the idea is that it doesn't end there. It's, we, we don't want it to just end at knowing something more and raising awareness about a problem like, for example, that our mangroves are being destroyed. We want to, we want to catalyze action and we want to motivate and empower our citizens so that we can really have a, have, a, have a fighting chance at solving these really big problems that we're facing. And we're talking here in Miami, we have sea level rise, we have salt water intrusion into our freshwater aquifer, we have extreme heat, we have hurricanes that are intensifying, we have our coral reefs getting bleached, we have so many problems right here that we are, we are ground zero for a reason. And in the conversations that I've had with the students in the school over the course of the past month, these, these issues, these problems that directly impact us and will continue to do so over the next few decades as we have children and grandchildren, they're, they're not being acknowledged. And if we don't acknowledge them as a community, we're, we're not going to be planning for them effectively. We're not gonna be preparing. And, and really that's what this, this art project that we brought to Miami High is trying to do. It's trying to have us be able to plan for our families, right? So if, if you're investing in a home, but you're not aware that that home is at four feet above sea level, what's gonna happen in the years to come as you hand that, if, if you're one of the parents in this room, as you, as you hand that house down to your child, and then that child is unable to sell that house because they can't get, there, there are no more 30 year mortgages for that area. The, the flood insurance is through the roof. There are these really complicated issues that we need to understand now. We, we need to be talking about this now. And so as, as a Miami-Dade County that cares for one another, we are trying to facilitate these conversations such that you have your neighbor right next door. Talk to them, engage them. They're, they're gonna be dealing with the same problem that you are. And with these yard signs that you've been seeing behind us over the course of the past 20 minutes or so, you know, they're not political. This, as was mentioned, these are not political yard signs. Climate change cannot be this super partisan issue if we're gonna really tackle it effectively. So we need to figure out how to come together, how to reach those people who don't care at all and, and figure out how we can plan. That's in Xavier's uh, letter that I wrote, it's about giving us the tools, giving our community the tools to make a difference, to make an impact. And as a lot of the students that I spoke with over the course of, that, of the last month agreed, here in Miami-Dade County, we should be leading in climate action. We should be leading not just the state of Florida, we should be leading the country and with the power that the United States of America has, we should be leading the world in adaptation and mitigation. We need, we need to be leading that. And I joke around with some of the kids I have. There's a lot of Beta Club students here today. I was joking yesterday about yeah, go Beta. <laughs> uh, we were joking about how loud Miamians are, right? Miamians, oh yeah, we're loud. We know we're, we're loud people. Well, we need to channel that loudness in the in in, in a in a good way here. We need to channel it towards towards action. Um, and so what we have created for you today is a town hall where we can have a conversation and, uh, and a dialogue, but importantly, afterward, when we walk through those doors, there are a bunch of organizations, a bunch of nonprofits, a bunch of groups that are here to work with you guys. They're, they're doing great work right now. A few were named and they, they could use your help, right? Like if, if you're sitting there and you're like, okay, we have these massive problems, what can I do? 
we want you to be able to walk through those doors and learn about the problem solvers that are here with you today and figure out how you can get connected with them and how you can, how you can contribute, right? And so this is where Xavier's line that he uses all the time is that his art is very much, in, it's in service of community, but it's for the purpose of building a cadre of engaged and science literate and empathetic people. So he's planted acres and acres of mangroves over the course of the last few years, over the course of the past couple of decades with his art projects. He doesn't care as much that those mangroves get planted. He cares more that you planted the mangrove. It is that experience, it's, a, it's an experience that you will keep with you and that will help to shape you as you, as you grow. It's something that you're not gonna forget. So with this, I think uh, I would like to open it up to, uh, to the audience. Um, we, wanna, we, wanna make this, um, we wanna make this engaging, we wanna make this interactive. We've gone over a lot of very complicated things with regard to the science, with regard to the law, from a local to uh, an international level. Um, so what I would love to do is just open it up and see if anybody has either any comments that they would like to make, any concerns that they have that they would like the group here to talk about, any questions that they would like to pose to us. Um, so with that, I see one hand in the back if I can have a microphone and then we're gonna just keep going like that. Good evening. Um, thank you for hosting this. I think this is a very important event. Um, I just wanted to ask, forgive me for not remembering your name, the lawyer in the group. That's how I'll make the distinction. Um, I just want to know how have uh, you potentially or how do you plan to engage environmental law as it relates to Everglades restoration to promote new legislation to combat sea level rise? And is uh, conservation, uh, conservation and restoration of Everglades direct, uh, directly correlated to sea level rise? What is that correlation if so? Okay, there's a, there's a lot in that question. And, and let me make sure I heard it all, actually. So the first part is like just asking about kind of what types of laws are there to address sea level rise? As it relates to the Everglades specifically. Okay, cool. All right, so we have a lot of uh, projects in the Everglades in uh, both kind of technical and legal, I should say. So the Everglades, a lot of the Everglades, as you know, are, uh, are national parks and they're owned by the federal government. And the federal government then has a lot of power to make decisions about how they manage their land. But we also have a lot of lands around the Everglades that are part of the whole system. I, mean, I should say a lot of lands around the federal government's lands that are part of the system. We've got the tribal lands, we've got the agricultural lands. We just even have kind of different water users that are affecting the Everglades. And so when you have a kind of a big problem like that, which we sometimes call a wicked problem because it's so uh, complicated, when you have these wicked problems like that, it's hard to solve them through any of these one levels or one entities. So a lot of the Everglades projects right now are collaborative projects where they're bringing together all of these different stakeholders and policymakers. And there's a larger Everglades, do you know the acronym? It's like the, you know what is it? No, 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 there's this, it's like surf or something. I can't remember the acronym. I'm sure the people in the back of the room are actually just cringing because I can't get it right. But there, you know, we have these law. There is kind of a, a really great Everglades program that is being uh, run in conjunction with trying to figure out what laws and policies we need to restore and address the Everglades. We have some laws that some things we could do without having to change a law. Like the federal government today, as the big landowner, could just change some of the ways they manage the Everglades. But we also need to think about agriculture and the laws we have that are governing our agricultural lands, both the amount of water that they can use and the amount of inputs, like the pesticides and the fertilizers they can use, because that all gets into the Everglades. So it's like a problem where we need all of these different players to come together to try and deal with that. And sea level rise and climate change is right in there, both as part of the problem, right? One of the reasons the Everglades might be suffering because if we have changes in the water tables and the interaction of the salt water, and the fresh water, but also because we really want the water glaze, the Everglades to be there to help us mitigate climate change because it's a big carbon sink and it's helping us as well. So you're gonna hear me always say this, it's like there's no kind of a problem like that. It's not one law that's gonna change that. It's gonna be a bunch of different laws and a bunch of different entities working in concert. And that's what makes it so important to really get on the same page.
Hey everyone, thank you so much to all of the presenters. Thank you Adam and to Xavier who can't be here tonight. I just want to make a comment in response to some of the things that were said because I know that climate change can seem really doom and gloomy, but I wanted to let all the students know here that in fact, when it comes to the climate movement, the students are really leading the charge and in the city of Miami and in Miami-Dade County. And this is gonna sound like a shameless plug, but at Clio we have a group called Gen Cleo Youth Advocacy Movement, and it's students from the ages of like 13 to around 21. But recently, like last year at the budget meeting, recently um, at some of the, the city of Miami's commission meetings, the students went and advocated to get two youth seats on the Climate Resilience Committee, which Nico sits on. And so there are tons of opportunities for students just like you to advocate on behalf of yourself, on behalf of your community, to fight the climate crisis. So if you want tools, resources, trainings, I invite you to come sign up for, uh, to become a Gen Cleo member. But it's not just our Gen Cleo students, it's students from all across the county that have been standing up. Last year at the budget meeting, they advocated for more money for the city of Miami's resilience committee, uh, resilience office, and they got it. So kids are standing up, they're attending these commission meetings, they're speaking up, they're using the power of their voice. And so I want you all to understand that even though you might not be able to vote yet, you still have a lot of power and the adults are listening. So, you know, stand up, don't be shy, speak your mind. And the antidote to the doom and gloom of the climate crisis is taking action. Once you start doing things in your community or even in your home, you start to feel better about it. So I just want to put that out there and thank the panel again for your contribution. Could I add one thing to that too? Prime example of how students and youth have made a change too. There was a bill, uh, HB 741, House Bill HB 741, don't worry what that means, but it was essentially a bill that says, hey, we're gonna take all the profits from solar and renewable energies that was going to, would go to the people that, you know, have renewable energy or solar panels on their home and give it to the companies and essentially cut what was called net metering in half, um, which would slash any kind of solar energy. Now, keep in mind that Florida gets the ninth most amount of sun, or excuse me, Miami gets the ninth most amount of sun of any city in the entire United States. Yet we're like maybe not even in the top 50 of utilizing solar energy. So this bill is bad. I, I don't know why it was ever proposed in the first place. Um, but we got the governor to veto it. So that happened because of the youth. So if you feel like there is a change, a change that you can make individually, collectively with your friends and with everybody that you grew up with, or even just your, your parents telling them that, hey, we should stand up on this bill, you can make a change. And that's a prime example of that. Myra, I think we have a hand right up here. Uh, good evening. Um, how much time would we theoretically have left before we could actually do anything to help change? Great question. And what I would say is, um, the understanding of kind of where the world is headed, like business as usual, is actually being ratcheted down. So it used to be thought that we might be on target for a world of five degrees Fahrenheit plus increase by the end of the century. We're actually now looking at a world where we're kind of pitched towards a three degrees Celsius increase and with more action we could head down to two. So for your question of kind of, you know, how much time do we have, I think it's important to recognize that a lot is happening, but as Jesse and Coates described, it's not happening fast enough. And so I think the real question is how to motivate more action in the near term. And there's a really simple climate science basic point that I think is super helpful here. So to get to a world where we have stabilized temperature on planet Earth, we no longer have additional global warming happening, we need to get to net zero emissions of heat trapping gases, especially carbon dioxide. So we need to get to a future where we're not putting any of these long-lived heat trapping gases into the atmosphere. 
And so that is why we're seeing so much emphasis on the goal for 2030, how far can we get towards full decarbonization of our economy and our agriculture. 2040, 2050, can we get to zero around the middle of the century? If we can do that, we will do an incredibly good job of avoiding some of the worst possible impacts of climate change. So I think this question of kind of um, how long does it take, I think the, the question should be like, how much can we do tomorrow and next week and next year, recognizing as everyone's saying, um, the voices of young Miamians are way more important than the oldest generation. So keep it up. Um, can I, may I ask another question? What are things that us as individuals can do uh, to help either raise awareness or actually do something physically to help? Thank you for that question. Um, so I want to I want to answer it in two ways. So one way is you could focus on how we can you can reduce your own carbon footprint, and so that means being very aware of how much carbon you are putting into the atmosphere by, for example, eating meat and dairy. So in one way, you could you know, do a really good job of reducing your carbon footprint by eating less meat and dairy because of the way that industrial agriculture, industrial farming is, is hurting the planet. So that is you know, a big thing you could do. There are, are small individual things that like you know, public transit or biking as opposed to Riding it in a single, riding in a car by yourself. Um, you know, the biggest thing that is probably the most controversial thing is not having children, and you can't tell people not to have children. <laughs> um, but that's it. On like the list of uh, you know biggest carbon footprint reducers, that that is it. But what I want to really emphasize here is that we need systemic action. We need systemic change. So we want to model that behavior and we want to do everything that we can. We want to recycle, we want to use less single use plastics. We, we want to, you know, we want to do these things and we and we should and, I, we, and everybody on the stage would encourage you to do that. But it's really, really important that we vote, that we hold our elected officials accountable, that we go and we organize in a way that has foundational systemic change happen. So that's where it's, we want to pull the blame away from you individually. And, and that's actually something you guys, if you go on Twitter, you might see like BP or Exxon saying like, what are you doing to reduce your carbon footprint? <laughs> they're blaming you, like they're making it your fault when they're the ones like extremely polluting the planet, right? So I want to, it's not your fault, it's not my fault, right? But it is on us to, I mean, it's on us as citizens of this planet who care about each other, who care about future generations, to act. Um, so I think that's the way that I would want to answer, answer that question. Thank you. To, to add to that too, that's exactly the reason why you should be angry, because if BP is saying that, trying to shift the blame onto you, they're saying that, hey, well, at the end of the day, you know, even if we don't hit this emissions goal, you didn't, you ate a burger today or you took a shower for 20 minutes with hot water, like that's your fault, you know? Um, yes, there are changes that you can make individually and eventually they will have a ripple effect. So it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do them, um, but at the end of the day, the biggest impact that you can have is, is educating somebody that you feel like, you know, a friend that's not here right now, telling them that, hey, we should go to the next commission meeting because they're talking about something on climate change or there's gonna be a rally that Clio's having or that Catalyst is having or Miami Climate Alliance is having and we should be there. Um, also, to the amount of time that we have for this place too, there's two parts to that. There's the science side that Catherine alluded to, but then there's also the social, social side too. Before sea level rise even completely threatens places like Miami Beach and is constantly inundated by water and things of that sort, people are moving this way and moving people that live over here out further away from these areas too where they have nowhere to go. That's even more reason to be angry and say, hey, no, um, you can't build here. We don't want we don't want you to build your hundred story, you know, tall uh, high rise here, things of that sort too, because that's what's going to keep pushing people out. And next thing you know, we have nowhere to live. Um, so it's more than just the science; it's also a social thing too. Uh, thank you. If I can, I'm gonna. I see a hand right here, and ask Carl is getting the mic. I want to just add one last thing to, the, to answer the question. 
and that is in the presentations that we gave at the school, one of the key things we said is for you to develop your theory of change. And so what that means is you figuring out how you can align what you love doing, what brings you joy, what, what you're good at, and that could be playing a sport, that could be drawing, that could be like literally whatever it is that you guys like to do video games. Figure out how your passions can align with the problems that need to be solved. And then I promise you that you're going to be much more motivated to put in this work if you know it's something that you really care about. So that's just one thing that I wanted to add in there. Um, and let me throw it over to, uh, to Clark. Thanks, Evan. I just wanted to follow up with um, solutions because as you can tell, I'm, I'm not from Miami, I'm actually from the UK. Um, but I don't know about you, but I'm freezing in this room. When we think about missions, and it's been spoken about already, uh, almost 20% of emissions are created globally through residential buildings and commercial buildings. Actually, residential buildings, our homes, are the largest amount of where emissions are created when you break it down into subsectors. So if you think about your own home, and you think about what set point you've got your AC set at, maybe think about turning that up. And the other one, <laughs> Whoever controls the AC in this room for the school there, get them to turn that up also. Um, that's one thing I would say as solutions collectively is probably a, a really huge area we could all do more in. The other one for me is banking. Barclays Bank is one of the top five or ten fossil fuel aligned banks. I've been there with them since I was 16. Last year, I made a New Year's resolution to finally, after a bit of few emails back and forth, and them still not telling me when they're going to divest uh, divest from fossil fuels, I changed my bank. I changed it to Triodos. Triodos is a new bank that aligns with social justice um, values. It aligns with climate values and, and various other things. We have another. We have one now in the U.S. called Climate First Bank. Climate First Bank is a Floridian bank founded by Ken Moreau, he's an amazing guy. He's onto his third bank, because his second bank, the shareholders took it in a direction he didn't want to. Now, I don't know how many banks with Bank of America, or Wells Fargo, or Chase, or all the others, but if I had climb the first bank as an option when I moved to Miami four years ago, I wouldn't have been banking, I would have gone with them and not Wells Fargo as I am now. I'm moving on in a few months. My wife is an amazing woman. She's the British Consul General for Florida, Puerto Rico, and US Virgin Islands. But we, our, our term is coming to an end. Um, but I was represented, I, I found a growth carbon when I, uh, when I moved to Miami and started to realize all the issues that are facing us. And there's, there's a lot that we can do. Yes, we need to, you know, uh, vote for policy and, and, and various things, and we have a voice. But um, a few little things I just mentioned, ask your mums and dads who they bank with. It's an easy process now to change. I did it after 30 years with Barclays. We have our set point at 78 in our home, and if we can get that in here, that would be much more pleasant. Thanks, everyone. or fails, I think when it comes to the work that we do, it's think about it like slow activism. So if your life was changed by this project, I would call it a success. You know, just I, I'm, I can say that I'm disappointed that this entire auditorium isn't filled, sure. 
but I think that the, the work that we do uh, is, is always evolving. And so when it comes to this, this process, it's always building off of itself. And so Xavier has a project that he launched at the North Pole, and then he learned from that and has another idea, and then okay, then he morphs that into this new project that he starts a few years later. And so when it comes to the work that we're doing, we're gonna learn from our experience here at Miami High. We're gonna figure out how to improve it, how to optimize it. Um, but ideally, this project is really just a, a, a starting point. If anything, Miami High was, in our minds, a pilot for taking this type of project uh, to a much larger scale. Um, this is something that we see could be implemented in coastal cities all around the world. So the reception that we've gotten from your school has actually been amazing. The, the students and the classes have been very excited about it. I've seen some yard signs and trash cans. You know, unfortunately, you can't get every kid to um, buy in. But uh, overall, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy with how this has gone. And I think we're always, we're always just learning and growing and trying to, um, yeah, to figure out how to do it better the next time. I like, I like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I saw I saw there was a hand back there.
I heard, how do you have conversations with, uh, you call them climate deniers, and there was a last part, could you repeat the last part? Is it even worth having that conversation? Yeah, so I teach a class on this. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of come back to why is this such a polarized issue and recognizing, as Jesse and Coase described, that part of what's going on is that the climate issue seems like it's suggesting we need to transform our economies. That kind of positions it in the space of politics in a way that then becomes entangled with ideology. And in a way, I think of, you know, kind of what does give us trust in the science of climate change? It's the fact that the scientific community, first of all, is really diverse across every possible discipline, mode of doing analysis. And what's pretty cool about science is it's a process that is open for criticism and revision through time. So kind of if this were a great hoax on the part of scientists, this would be like climate science happening in a way that no other science has ever happened. So kind of against that backdrop, a lot of the thinking is that kind of starting out, you know, with my uncle from rural Utah who does not believe in climate change by telling him, you know, uh, hey Ray, don't you think you should get, you know, electric vehicle and put some solar panels on your car? Um, he might really react hard, right, and not go well. And I've done this, and <laughs> it does not go well. But kind of instead, the basic idea is that, you know, if I ask Ray about, you know, what he's observing, and uh, a fire ran through his valley, um, really rural area of Utah, and almost burned down his home, and he actually was like there, you know, helping direct the fire crew to his home. And he's noticing changes in terms of how much snow they're getting in any given year. And letting it be something that is more about listening as compared to quote unquote conversion ends up becoming a really important starting point for having those conversations. So that's one theory of change is just allowing there to be dialogue. There, as Adam described, many other theories of change. So you could also take a combative approach and say, we're gonna, you know, not try to worry about the 8% of Americans right now who probably won't change their mind. And instead, we'll just push that off the table and ask about everyone else who is interested in moving forward. Recognizing that kind of at the extremes of opinions on the climate issue, it's about kind of like 8% of Americans on either extreme of feeling like this is the end of the world tomorrow versus total denial. And most everyone else is kind of in between interested in thinking about the issue in a critical way and not necessarily having it be something that's a lightning rod right to start from. So I think there's a lot there and also something where when solutions start happening and we realize that clean energy is cost competitive, it is better for our health as compared to living next to a refinery, it's not polluting our waterways, it's not harming fish and kids and people whose homes are sited in some of these really rather toxic areas, oftentimes the solutions become really appealing, even if the problem of climate change can seem scary. And you'll see a lot of parts of the country that are all about wind, do not believe in climate change, but are all about wind energy. And that's kind of a really fascinating thing. You can also go up to Staten Island and there's a lot of climate action that's happened there on the part of climate deniers. And I think we could say there's similar dynamics here in Florida, where there are some people who may not believe in climate change, but they know they have a flooding problem. And so I think recognizing that there's no one way to think about the climate issue, and oftentimes solutions and hope are a much better place to start as compared to doom and gloom, and open-ended conversations are a much better place to start as compared to yelling at my Uncle Ray. Um, I think there's a lot to be said there. Really, really good question. I just have a small part to that story, which is that we did this study where we looked at uh, laws that were mostly in rural areas, Iowa, Kansas, and, 
And the, the law actually was going to do the same thing at the end of the day. But when we phrased, when the laws was phrased, were phrased as a climate change law, there was very little support for it. But when they instead said, this is a law to help with the flooding that's happening every year in the Mississippi River. This is a law that's going to help with the, the drought that the farms are experiencing. Those policies were passed and endorsed. And, and, and part of me hates that. Part of me is like, I hate that we have to kind of trick people into supporting climate change. But I do think that sometimes we can get effective changes. People are so afraid of the word that they won't engage with you at all. So sometimes taking that word away, taking the phrase climate change out of it, you can have actually productive conversations. I'd like to add one last thing onto that, and that is, as Catherine mentioned, you know, listening to, to the person, to the people that, that you're talking to is super important, understanding what they value and what they care about, if it's their family, if it's their home, if it's, na if it's national security, if it's immigration, you know, whatever their touchstones are. Understand those before you really like dive in to anything, but then really what I wanna say is patience, because when it comes to these conversations, it, it, can, it can take time, and that means repetition. That means you're not gonna necessarily talk to that uncle of yours and in one conversation, okay, now he's on your side. I would suggest storytelling, so as opposed to, I'm gonna give you all these facts about carbon dioxide, you tell a story about you know this friend that you know that was affected by you know by this, or you, you hear things on the news, you learn something, and then you can relay that story, not in a combative way, but just in like a oh did you hear did you hear about this kind of way? And like as, as this starts to pile up over time, and you're very intentional about this, it's week after week. Oh, you send you send an article that you saw to that person, like oh check this out. You know li little things, they start to add up. And it's, that's where it's like, don't get discouraged when you know they put up that person or whoever it is puts up a wall and doesn't want to talk. You know, just under, understand that they, um, you know, they have learned things that you haven't learned, and you've learned things that they haven't learned, and you're just coming together um, to try to help each other understand reality a little bit better. Um, so with that, I, I would just say patience, storytelling, listening is all uh, really important. And one more thing to add to that too. Even if they never understand completely at the end of the day, um, it doesn't matter, you keep doing what you're doing um, because ultimately it will save them and their kids and their kids and their kids, so. So I'll give you a couple. So the first thing that comes to mind, you mentioned social media. Um, there's a, a page, a group called Intersectional Environmentalist, and it was founded by a woman named Leah Thomas, and so Leah also has her own um, Instagram. But the focus of this is having, having society realize that climate isn't just this one abstract issue. It is integra inter integrally connected to everything else. So if you care about racism, if you care about LGBTQ rights, if you care about women's rights, if you care about any of these um, things that people are going out and protesting for, there, there, is, there is a connection between, between everything. And, it's under, and so I think that that is one group that I would like to highlight. And then um, there's a book called All We Can Save, which is uh, edited by Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who's a marine biologist, but it is an anthology of essays by leading women in the climate movement. Um, and it's all about hope and solutions and inspiration, and in a, uh, you know, with a topic that is, can be depressing, overwhelming, or sad, um, it's a really great, great resource. 
I'm gonna think about that question a lot more and definitely send those to you because uh, I feel like I have a ton on the tip of my head, but I just can't think of them. Um, I think a lot of pages that do need to be amplified usually are for marginalized communities and populations as well. And I think one um, that I actually had the chance to participate with was a, a group called Black and Environment. Um, and they do a lot of, they try to amplify a lot of the black artists and, and, and not even just, just people of color that are all you know experiencing climate change differently and things in the environment differently. Um, and they try to amplify some things like sustainable fashion, eco-friendly fashion, or um, using the, the environment to heal. Uh, there's, there's many different aspects of it. And I think starting there and amplifying their mission and their voice um, is something that you can that can go a long way as well. But I'm gonna think about that more too because I can't think of it right now. <laughs> All right, as one of the professors on the panel, I'm gonna give you some academic writers who are just fabulous. So. First, kind of picking up on intersectional environmentalists and black in the environment, I would say two scholars that I think carve a really wonderful arc in the history of justice in the environment, starting with Robert Fuller, the, the grandfather of environmental justice, really elevating the concept that people who are low income, people who are of color, are disproportionately exposed to the hazards of water contamination, super fun sites, air pollution, and this is not by accident across our country. And that's really painted into climate justice and then energy justice. And at the Department of Energy right now, we have Shalonda Baker. Her papers are fabulous, thinking about the, the justice associated with the clean energy transition. And she now has a totally unique role that has never happened before in the US government where she's helping ensure that the clean energy transition in terms of all of the US government funding behind, behind it is just and equitable. And I can keep going uh, in terms of some of the major pillars of how we understand these issues and really can say for sure that this is urgent now and there are immense equity issues. I think what's kind of fun is knowing that there are a lot of really deep roots in terms of nuanced evidence behind all of the action needed now. Well, I was gonna say Robert Bullard. <laughs> I, I definitely think uh, Robert Bullard, I think there's a lot of amazing environmental uh, activist lawyers out there. Uh, a lot of the, the Southern Environmental Law Center does amazing work and there's somebody who's been working all throughout the South on both the climate justice issues and others. I also, uh, uh, for a, uh, perhaps an odd one I'm gonna throw in there is I really like this group called Eco Anxiety which they uh, actually embrace the idea that we should be anxious and that embrace kind of, so it's it's, it's not exactly hopeful, but it, it can be depending on how you look at it. But it's like this idea that there, it's developing a little bit the psychology of climate change and how hard it is for us to, to grapple with it, how emotionally and psychologically it can be challenging. And they actually encourage you to kind of face that and, and grapple with it and, and use it to energize you. like success in this project and I want to agitate Adam a little bit and just give so much power to you all because this auditorium could be completely empty and we're here right nobody had even talked about elevations before like I talked about this in my classroom like we don't normally know our number and now even the folks that aren't in here in this room with us today are thinking about this so I want to pose something to the panel um, because I talk to the kids a lot about like my radicalizing moment, which for me felt like watching Go Diego Go as a little kid growing up in Costa Rica and Guatemala and seeing myself there. As you are talking to this like blossoming crowd of people who are excited about the climate and how to make change, what were some of the early stages of you all's growth that sort of brought you to this moment and that can they can see like reflected in themselves. So I will say what radicalized me, it wasn't, I didn't get radicalized into climate. I got radicalized into the environment through the ocean. So for me, 
when I was in elementary school, I was lucky enough to get to go to Belize with my dad, and we went diving on a reef. And it just blew my mind. Like, honestly, I had never seen anything like that before. The amount of life, the vibrancy, it was just, it was just amazing. And at that moment, I, like, I got up on the boat like, from that experience, and I, I wanted to be a marine photographer. Like, that was my thing. I'm going to do that. And then that progressed to being a scuba instructor. That progressed to being a marine biologist. And it was really just this experience in, in nature, in the ocean, that catalyzed a passion for other life on the planet, for, for the environment, and then me wanting to help protect it um, because I felt like it was so precious. Um, so that, that is, the uh, for me, what started um, the, the path towards here today. Okay, I'm gonna date myself, but I, I had a quarter life crisis. So I was like 25, I was doing my dissertation, and I just had this moment of eco-anxiety where I was studying the coastal ocean, and I realized these oceans were warming, there was overfishing, there was plastics in the ocean, and I was trying to understand like this very refined aspect of how nature was thriving. And so I, I punted, I left that area of research, I, I finished my degree, but then I went straight to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and worked there for five years and had this immediate exposure to what Jesse was describing, you know, 196 government scientists from countries around the world thinking about this issue from every possible angle and really thinking about the, the inequity of this issue across the globe as a whole, not just within any given area. And for me, that was pretty profound. It was incredibly hard work, so now I'm just a lazy faculty member and very happy to not be doing the most intense job ever. Catherine is not lazy. Um, so uh, I don't know if my accent has given me away or not, but I'm from Wisconsin. And I grew up actually in the city of Milwaukee and a pretty super urban area. And I had, uh, I had never been on a hike before. I had never uh, kind of thought about the environment. It was a pretty polluted envir environment. I had a pretty bad asthma the whole time I was a kid. And, and the environment was not like a thing. It was, it was, and, and I'm older than her. So it, it just wasn't a thing. It was never something we talked about in school. It wasn't something I experienced. I never would have called myself an environmentalist or thought about anything. Uh, we just started recycling. That was like a new thing. And I went, I had this like amazing opportunity to be an exchange student when I was in high school and I got to go to this, this completely different world of Norway. And it was so weird. They like, they just thought about the world so differently. They just, everything was just so much more thoughtful from their land use planning to, to you know, the, the experiences that they found in nature that were so important to them. And it was just such a different experience to me and it made me realize, you know, things didn't have to be the way they were and that we could make changes and that life wasn't just this one set thing. So that's when I started kind of thinking about where, where where was going to be my place in it? And, and, and I'm still not a hiker, but like, you know, like the idea of like, what role could I play in making my hometown, my communities look different? There we go. Long story short for me, um, I studied weather growing up. Um, I was a nerd, still am. Um, so like to the point where if somebody would drop like a wrapper on the ground, I'd be like, pick it up. Like, what are you doing? Um, and I just was just like super protective of the environment. As time went on though, uh, I saw, I went to New Orleans and I can't remember when this was, I think it was like 2017 maybe. And I remember going there and seeing certain parts of New Orleans being still devastated by Katrina and other parts being just peachy fine. And I wondered why. Um, and then I did my master's thesis and I read a book called The Color of Law, which I recommend everybody to read at some point in your life, and that highlighted a lot of the different inequities, why people experience certain climate change hazards more than others. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna use my weather background to figure it out. And long story short, here we are. So one way or another though, even if you don't study weather, there's a way you can apply your expertise or your interest into solving this issue. Let's get a round of applause. So, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the time, so it's 7.40. What I, what I would love to do um, is, is first 
thank this panel for being here. If you guys could just give them a big round of applause. Big round of applause. Uh, um, we, we, we find this to be, I, can, I think I speak for everybody in saying how motivating it can be to have conversations like this where we're actually, there are people, you know, that you see other people that care um, and it's, it's, it's motivating, it's inspiring. So um, with that being said, hopefully you're sitting in the audience there like, okay, I want to be part of this somehow. I don't want to just sit at my house and watch Netflix all day. I want to do something. So what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna guide us to is the Community Connection Fair. Um, bef before we go out and before I ask you guys to go and learn about all of these great organizations that are you know, right through those doors for you, um, I'm gonna have a video play which was taken of Xavier here at Miami High a couple of weeks ago. And this video shows those parents that are in the audience um, a little bit of what, we're, what we were doing. And I think um, as, soon as, as soon as this video ends, then I think let's just go ahead and break and we'll all head out together. And you know, we have, we have time to, to talk and to learn from one another still. This panel is gonna be right at the table as soon as you walk out of those doors on the right hand side. Um, so we, this, does, this conversation doesn't have to end right now. We would, we would love for it to continue out, out there. Um, and, but we will move so that we're not in front of you. Then you can go beyond yourself. beyond thinking about yourself as how am I going to personally succeed or how am I going to make a living and think about how am I going to serve, how am I going to care for others. I promise you that you will be stronger. You will be stronger because you will be building these skills on how to adapt, how to communicate, how to see into the future, how to problem solve, how to lead. Those skills are great for you whether you're your head of your household or whether you're working for someone or starting your own business. So part of what this entire art project is, is teaching you how to lead because we know you love. And he literally gave me a piece of that glacier and I took it in my studio in Antarctica and I put that glacier on a piece of paper, I put some paint on it and I just watched it melt. That water, that was created by a mountain glacier is the same water that literally threatens to drown our beloved city. I was painting the precursor of the horrors to come. And that is what I am bringing to your front yard. I am literally bringing Antarctica. This is water from Antarctica to your front yard. And as this ice melts, the sea level rises. And when that sea level rises to the elevation of your home, then you will be flooded. And when that sea reaches the number that you're going to draw on this marker, that means Antarctica came to your front door, not as a piece of art, but literally as water. But I just want to keep one timeline in your mind, and that is your city, your community, your kids, the class of 2062. And if you begin to become aware of this now, and it's not like somebody else's problem, but it's your problem, and it's not something that they'll deal with then or they'll find technology then, but something you can begin to tackle now. Then I think you're becoming that kind of leader that helps grow the city, but also helps grow your skills. This entire campaign that we're creating is about you understanding what your number means. I created the underwater to help communities, to help your mom and dad to help you understand your vulnerability to rising seas, but also to give you the tools to be able to solve this problem. So I don't think I'm going to say anything that will follow that in any way, shape, or form, so I'm going to just thank you all so very much. Uh, please head on out to the back, learn, get connected, get involved. Um, we want to talk to you, and, uh, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.